people joining will be starting in about a minute just to make sure everybody can hop on first. Okay, we will get started. So the recording has already started. We'll be recording these meetings to post later on our website or YouTube, and they'll be distributed. If, as you're coming in, I think everyone has this, but if you could put your team number in your name, that would help us know who all is here. Um, we want to keep this a graciously professional space, so please keep that in mind in all your interactions, and we will have people monitoring the chat. Um, Kayush, would you rather people raise your hands to ask questions throughout or at the end? I think either either is fine. I think if you have a burning question, feel free to ask. And we also have a specific question session at the end as well. Okay. And we will have people watching for raised hands in chat. And with that, I'll hand it off to Kayush and the Sonic Squirrels. Tim, you want to share your screen? Yeah, sure. Uh, we should probably introduce ourselves, I suppose, yeah. for the recording and stuff. Sure. So I'm Kayush. I'm the chief engineer for Sonic Squirrels. Yeah. And I'm Tim. I'm our current lead programmer. Okay, so I guess I'll just kind of explain what this whole presentation is about. So um, we've learned a lot in the past couple of years about vision, uh, advantage scope, and swerve. And I, we thought that that, uh, that would be some stuff that uh, you guys might be interested in. <clears throat> so basically, uh, we're going to start with... Um, what we learned about like the swerve library from 3061 and that's not just swerve swerve stuff they also have some uh vision stuff and um it's pretty nice uh then we're going to go into advantage scope and the simulation you can do with that uh and then some vision stuff and then a little bit of autonomous yeah so this is the library that we found and, and used for our swerve this year um, sort of and vision, a couple other things. So, uh, FRC team 3061 made it and super good library. So, yeah. So, kind of the top level view of what 361 lib is it's basically a uh, main part of it is the sort of library. It's Falcon based sort of library. Um, it also has a simulated sort of draft, which is really nice. So, we're able to simulate um, driving as well as uh, we built a couple of simulators for elevators. So that was really key. Um, it has photon vision based vision framework. So it kind of helps you introduce yourself to vision. It's a good framework for that. Uh, and the kind of the biggest thing that we like is that it combines advantage kit into its code. So it's a really good starting point for teams who are not too sure about advantage kit or not sure how to begin with it. This kind of does all the groundwork for you and gives you a really good introduction as well as it also has some examples on how you can expand upon some subsystems and create more subsystems following the advantage kit framework so why you know why was 361 key to our success so kind of the, the biggest thing here was that 361 uh lib allowed us to kind of skip past the low level implementation of the groundwork that's needed for swerve and, and vision um, Last year, we tried using the SDS library, but as it has a kind of discontinued support, there's no active support to it. So it's kind of lagging behind the features. For example, um, like Canivores, uh, it didn't support that. And like someone else had to PR that and add that in. So it's kind of abandoned now. Um, also, there are some other libraries out there too for Swerve. For example, it's 3364 has a base Falcon Swerve. That's super good. Um, good sort of library, but it doesn't have vision or advantage kit integration, which is what we liked a lot. And you know, again, it's a really good starting point for advantage kit and also simulation. Um, it really allowed us to 
focus on some higher level logic, some top level, you know, jump straight into commands uh, that we want for a robot, jump straight into the autonomous system we developed and just go straight into um, higher level applications of vision using localization. Um, and they also have a really clean and easy to follow startup guide on their uh, GitHub repo, which we're gonna go through and I can demonstrate how easy it is to actually set up a robot. Oh, no. Cool. So just a couple notes about the implementation. Um, it's fairly easy. You just kind of have to change some constants in a constants file. Um, so, you know, changing the offsets for motors, uh, selecting which version of the module you're using, you know, four I's, four threes uh, for SDS modules. They, I don't know if they natively support other module types, but since the code is extendable, you could add that support in yourself. Um, and there's also some tweaks that we did to um, the, they, oh, sorry. So you also have to change the number of cameras using because depending on uh, what you're using, how many cameras you have, you can select that. And some of the challenges or kind of notes we want to share with our uh, learning of using it. It's, you want to remember to tighten your module as well, specifically the um, can, can coders. Because those, if you don't glue down your magnets, they can slip over time and cause really weird issues where your modules aren't following the correct angle that you expect them to. Um, one thing to note that we kind of messed up this year on was that um, 361 follows the framework where you go top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. But when we were configuring our sort of modules, we configured them for top left, top right, bottom right, bottom left. So that kind of, it changed around the zero, one, two, three, it changed that pattern. Uh, so there were times when we were debugging our swerve and it was really awkward. So one thing that we did is on the bottom of our robot, we, uh, in Sharp, we just wrote down next to the module, which module number that corresponded to. And when the robot's over and we're debugging swerve, it's, it's really helpful. And Sharpie or tape, just kind of labeling those modules with upside down is really helpful. Uh, and there's also some optimizations we made to vision. This year, 361 added some more features to their vision framework to make it more reliable, but there's still more you can do with that as well. Um, I'm just gonna quickly share my screen and kind of demonstrate just how easy it is to set up a Swerve robot with 361 lib. So um, you can start off by going to their repo, let's see, code in the code. Uh, they have a really, really extensive README here with you know the features, um, some of how to configure the robots, uh, how to tune. Uh, this is really nice. It gives you like, pretty much an exact step by step to follow on you know starting up, debugging, uh, pretty much everything you could need. Um, so just following that for the physical robot, super great. And let's see, there's so you can see this line right here talking about addressing fix me. So we're just going to go through that. I'm going to show you just how easy it is. So Go to, so I clone the code here and if I open this up. You can see that what it said here was there's going to be fix me's uh, that you want to address in your default robot config. So if we search that here, right? If you search for search for fix me, you can see that there's a few. So there's a robot type and all this information, by the way, if you're confused on what a robot type is, there's kind of talks about it here as well. But basically, 361 supports multiple robots, so it has to array the simulation, uh, but that also means you can support multiple physical robots. Uh, so you can potentially even have like your 2022 robot uh, as a testing bed for your 2023 robot. But yeah, here, you know, it says update for whatever robot you want to use. Uh, same thing here, some of the functions that rely on that. Uh, and had the, the main juicy bit is this right here, this, this one config file where you go through, you can set all of the constants you need for your swerve. So the can IDs, the offsets, um, going further down, you have dimensions of your robot, some of the KPs and you know, KI, all that. The key, nice thing about this also is that it talks about how to configure KP uh, in the readme as well. Uh, you can kind of walk you through how to actually do that. So that's really nice. Um, moving on. Uh, Drive KS, KV, and KA, we had some trouble tuning these. Um, what 3061 recommends is, um, if we look for KS, you can see they actually have a command um, 
that kind of does it for you where you don't have to physically lock the modules um, characterization command. We tried using this and we also tried using sysid and neither of them really gave us correct numbers that we were going for. So we kind of had to extrapolate based on older robots we tuned and kind of almost guess what those values would be. Um, luckily it didn't make too much of a difference to how valuable it was. Uh, these defaults are pretty good, but you know, of course, tuning them to your specific robots is going to give you the best performance. Um, moving forward, this is probably the biggest one here, uh, you know, which module type you want right now, they only have four and four I, but again, because of how the code is structured, you can add your own, uh, module type if you really need to, uh, again, if we move on, uh, there's again, a little bit more. And as you can see, it's really nicely laid out and you can follow it uh, really easily. And again, they have a full guide here. So super, super great to follow along and get your robot set up. Okay, uh, so the next part is advantage scope. And advantage scope is like actually a game changer for first teams. Um, so it's a bit of an implementation process, but once you have it, there's so many uses with it. Um, so basically advantage scope is, um, it's the idea is that you can log every single value that's flowing through your code from like motor temperatures, the ambiguity of the left camera. Um, it has three primary functions, uh, log replay, diagnostics, and simulation, which we'll get into what each of those really mean in a second. Uh, so the log viewer is extremely helpful um, because WPI lib, if you put in a couple lines of code, it just makes this WPI log. And what you can do with that is it basically records everything that you were recording to like smart dashboard. Um, and then you can essentially just replay a match, which we'll uh, go into in a moment. Um, but one example of this is actually we had a, a problem where our robot just kept spinning in a match. And we used uh, advantage scope, its replay function, to figure out that that was a problem with our gyro. Um, and our gyro wasn't connected or something. Uh, so we were able to fix that issue. Um, diagnostics tool, it's pretty standard. You can do this kind of thing with like smart dashboard or shuffleboard, um, but its visualization is uh, far more advanced, I'd say. Um, the best feature, at least in my opinion, is their 3D field, uh, which allows you to give a 3D pose for your robot. And you can even throw in your own CAD files and it will show your own robot in 3D space. Um, and this is really helpful for like autonomouses uh, like let's say you're running your autonomous and uh, your robot isn't going the right direction. Um, you might be able to see in the code that uh, maybe like one of your cameras shows your robots over here when it's really right there. Um, and you could kind of debug the issue that way. Um, and then my favorite part about advantage scope is the simulation that you can do with it. So um, WPI lib actually already has this, uh, you can already kind of simulate your robot with uh, WPI lib. And then Advantage Scope allows you to open that simulation in their software. Um, and this is like really helpful because here, let me. Um, so, yeah, you can run full autonomous uh, in simulation, drive the simulated robot. You can even implement mechanisms like arms and stuff. Uh, and the big thing about this is a lot of times what holds programming back is that you need to wait for your robot to work on it, you know, um, especially in our case, because mechanical usually takes a while. Uh, so this is super revolutionary because you can be working on like things like autonomous uh, and like arm positions and stuff while the robot's being built, uh, allowing you to have your code ready much faster once the robot's handed to you. Um, so we're gonna, there's a couple, wait, okay, there we go. Uh, there's a couple videos. Um, I don't think we're gonna actually play them in this video or in this presentation because they're pretty long, uh, but we're definitely gonna send a link to this presentation and you can check out these videos. There's also links to them at the end of the presentation. Um, and it's super helpful. This one was, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, the left one was at Worlds and, uh, 
it was one of like the workshops at Worlds. And one one of the people from Mechanical Advantage talked a lot about how useful uh, Advantage Scope and stuff like that is. Um, and then the right one is uh, another workshop. So definitely check those out. Okay. Um, so yeah, this is the basic structure of, it, of Advantage Kit. Of course, it's a bit more complicated than this, but um, yeah, I'll try and explain it. Uh, and Kate, you can jump in if mm -hmm. you feel like I'm missing anything, you know? Uh, so yeah, the most challenging part of Advantage Kit and Advantage Scope is definitely the reorganization of code that's required. So instead of just having one subsystem file, you kind of have to have three or four, depending on if you have if you want to have a simulated robot. Um, so there has to be a real class, which kind of handles all of the robot specific stuff, like giving commands to the motors and defining robot specific variables like elevator height, um, stuff like that. And then you can also have the sim class, which is kind of like goes along with the um, real class. Uh, and that basically tells the sim exactly what it needs to do to replicate what the real robot would be like. Um, and the IO class is kind of in between the top level and the real and sim classes. Uh, and that kind of just logs everything. And um, let's see. Yeah, uh, it logs all the variables and it's where the functions are defined for the uh, real and sim classes. Um, and then the top level is where all the main logic is, uh, and that's where other subsystems can interact with the specific subsystems that you're using. Um, and yeah, if okay, you should have anything else to say about this. Yeah, I was going to say uh, we can share our code base and kind of run through example of what that kind of looks like. Yeah, that would be, be cool. You want to share your screen? You have to stop sharing first, I think. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, it's kind of like an example of what that would look like is let's take our elevator, for example, right? So probably the trickiest part is this IO class. There's this whole new concept that is added with Advantage Kit. The way that I like to think, so this right up here is just boilerplate. You can learn about that when you read more about Advantage Kit. Uh, the key is kind of the hardest part is figuring out what functions you want to define over here. So the way that I like to think about it is Imagine the real mechanism on the robot. Take its simplest part. It's going to be a motor, right? What does the motor really have to do, right? The motor, you know, run at a certain voltage, maybe run at a certain percentage. Um, this is for friction brakes. For our 2022 robot, we had friction brakes. Elevator prevented from going down for the climb, but that's moving past that. But also, let's say you know you want to set positional control. Um, maybe the on if you're using the onboard onboard PID loop, you want to adjust the constraints for the trapezoidal profile. That's that's the way that if you have limit switches, you can kind of set the uh, set that and get those values. So kind of thinking about the base case of what your motor really has to do. That's all that this file is supposed to be. And then in your actual when you create another file that implements this interface, it's an interface up here. And when you create a class in this interface, you can override all those functions here and you can give them certain logic, right? So for example, let's take a simpler one. Let's take the set percentage, right? You can see how we just give the motor some value, right? So it's abstracted down. And if we compare this to the simulator, uh, I don't know, do we have a set percentage in the simulator? Um, yeah, we do. So you can see how, um, now we're in the sim class over here, right? Same, we override the same method here. And you can see how it's given some different logic for the simulator instead of using, um, in this case, we call the voltage, right? And then you can see here, uh, do some logic for the simulator for that. But you can see how it's kind of abstracted down to where all you care about in your top level is this set percentage function up here. And talking about the top level, your top level elevator here. This is where you have your actual like core logic for your, your mechanism here. So uh, if you're running PID loops on the Rio instead of on the, on the motor, that's probably where this would be. Uh, if you have maybe something to do with commands, uh, anything that would interact with commands or other subsystems is on the top level. The IO class never touches anything outside of, um, like anything outside. So it's, it's purely for 
communicating with the hardware or you know simulator software. Um, so that's kind of the basics there. There's you know if you go to the Advantage Kit repo on GitHub, there's kind of example of that, and they have uh, an example project on how to set that up. But that's kind of the basic case there on how that works. Yeah. Okay. Um. So let's see. And we're back here. Cool. Um, so, okay. How was this important for us is the next question. Um, so essentially, uh, of course, there was what I was talking about with the simulator allowing our team to program and, uh, uh, and build the robot at the same time. Um, and it definitely really helped at the practice field because you had more time to test autonomous, more driver practice and less debugging that you had to do. Um, so it essentially just allowed us to focus on the more real life uh, aspects of the robot, like vision, um, rather than the logic that could be done in simulation. Um, so now we're going to show you a practical example of the debugging with Advantage Kit. Mm -hmm. So before I, so we could, before I do that, just a couple of notes. Um, the thing with Advantage Kit versus Advantage Scope, sometimes people can get confused. Advantage Kit is the actual like software library that you're going to put in your code base to log and create all of that. Advantage Scope is a software application that is used to read and write log files. Or no, I guess not write, but just, just view log files. Right, um, so right. if, I, if I share my screen here. So can you give me an example of what our debugging process might look like with Advantage Scope? So let's take a particular issue that we had. So let's take this match at Bunny Lake. Uh, and I think it was somewhere around halfway into the match. So I think right here. See, we score, and then after we go over that bump, robot spins wildly out of control. Uh, and it just kind of does that, no idea what's going on here, what's happening, who knows, right? So to debug that, what we did is that we pulled the log file from the Rio. And it takes a little bit to load. Eventually. Yeah. Can I, okay. Uh, zoom is in the way. Okay. So kind of the first guess you would have when a robot's spinning wildly out of control is probably something with the IMU, right? So our process for what that would potentially look like is we put up a line graph and we open up the gyro logging and see our position degrees. So this is also, by the way, this is kind of defaulted into 361 lib. So that's really nice because they give you this logging out of the box. Um, one thing that I like to do is go into the driver station folder and get this uh, enabled value because this kind of gives you a rough idea of where you are in the match. Um, so if we look at this, we can see that uh, at this point in the match, sorry, Zoom is being in the way. There we go. At this point in the match, we are stationary, uh, which seems kind of weird because it's, it's a long period of time where the angle has not changed at all. Seems kind of strange. So what we do is if we open up a 3D field and we log our position of our robot, can see that we, I'm just gonna make this a different robot so it's easier to tell what forward is. Forward is the claws of that crab. So if we play this, um, let's see. So let's go back here. Whoops, sorry. Kind of get zoom out of the way and do this. So let's see now, uh, let's go in, trying to find the moment here. So you can kind of see, okay, so we go here, we score. Uh, if you compare that to the video, that's what happened, right? We went in from, the bump side and we were scoring this cone and right after that we we're spinning wildly out of control and if we look here uh we score a little bit and then we drive out and then our robot just freezes at this particular angle and just stays there but you know we, we were there in real life we know that's not doing that spinning wildly out of control so that kind of completely narrows it down to it being a gyro issue probably being unplugged from the can bus um one also nice thing that uh, 361 kind of gives us the idea for is logging the current command you're running. Um, so we have a command that's called driver set rotation where it basically says, okay, drive at a certain angle 
Uh, so in our case, we use it for driving at zero degrees or 180 degrees, so either face forward or face backward. And you can see that in this exact moment, it was true. Uh, and we were spinning wildly out of control and it turned false later on. And if we look at the video later on, we can see that eventually after a couple of seconds, we gain back partial control. Um, and if we were to look at the 3D field as well, uh, once we start moving a little bit, which I guess we don't because it's completely broken, never mind. Uh, but you can see once we start moving, this fan turn faults. Uh, but this gives a really good idea as to what happened, right? We can guess, okay, the gyro thought it was stuck at what, 250 degrees, and we want to go to, let's say, zero degrees. If it continuously reports 250 degrees, uh, it's going to continue to try to spin the robot a certain direction, uh, which means that it's going to keep spinning in place. Um, one more kind of cool thing that you can... Hey, can, you, can I chime in yeah. for a quick second? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, there is also under the gyro, there is a connected Boolean, which we didn't Ooh. discover until much later, um, which will actually tell you, and you can there see you. right where it dies, you lose connection to the gyro. And, and this ended up being a hardware problem where the CAN bus to the gyro was severed at that point. So we went over that bump and something knocked the wire loose and that was it. So, yeah, but this is how we figured it out because it worked after the match. Mm -hmm. And you can see how, you know, you're able to tell exactly what command you're running. You can tell when it disconnected the exact angle. So super powerful logging tool. One just quick note, one nice thing that you can also look at is you can actually display the swerve module stage really nicely too. So, you know, in this case, it's not really that helpful, but you can kind of get a basic idea of what your store models are looking like and doing, uh, which can help you debug some issues as well. Yeah. So that's one application of debugging. Um, another example of how we used Advantage Scope and Advantage Kit logs to debug an issue was something with our autonomous, where it's going to be a little bit hard to see maybe, but so our robot's over here. It's a normal up to now. Um, I think you you stopped sh sharing your screen. Oh, sorry, my bad. Uh, let me do that again. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. So yeah, see, we're running our autonomous, so we're over here on the bump side. This camera up easier to see. So that's all good up to now. And over here, you can see it might be easier to see in this camera at the bottom, but our elevator hitches a little bit. It you see right there, it pauses for a millisecond there. Uh, replay that. Maybe I can play it at a slower speed as well. Um, at a half speed, you can see that as we're going up, we're going up, and then we hitch for a second there, uh, and then keep going. So that was a weird book that we we're trying to debug. And to do that, what we looked at was let me open up the other log file now. So now, now that I know what the issue is, it's going to be a little bit faster to, to debug it, but I'll give you a process of kind of what it looked like for us. So we know it's an issue with the elevator. So the first thing that came to my mind was maybe the motor like lost power for a millisecond, right? Maybe, maybe somehow that happened. So we can log the applied volts and the current that's being put into the robot. And again, I like also logging the enabled value to kind of get an idea of where we are. So you can see around here. So it's the last time our elevator goes up. It's the last action we do. And you can see that it's pretty normal. It looks like it's going up uh, it's a pretty normal curve. Doesn't seem to just spontaneously jump to zero. So that seems like it's okay. It seems like it's getting power correctly and that doesn't seem to be an issue. So moving on, let's, let's look at maybe some of the logic uh, that might be going wrong. So uh, let's look at our, our current height. Let's look at our target height. And again, if we zoom out a little bit, you can kind of get an idea. So first time scoring, second time throwing the cube on the low, third time scoring high. Again, you can see, okay, the target seems to be good. Not anything weird with that. The current height is steadily increasing. Uh, looks pretty normal. Um, if we were to throw on maybe our velocity, um, this looks fairly typical too. This jump is kind of weird maybe, but for the most part, this looks fairly normal. It's a normal curve of you know, speeding up, slowing down, and then for zero when you're at a constant height. So that looks fairly normal. The key that we were able to realize with this is our set point for our um, trajectory we follow with the elevator. When we log this, we can see if we zoom in a little bit, 
um, our set point is always above our current height, which makes sense is the target you're going for, right? But you can see at this moment over here, it goes below our current height, which is kind of interesting. It seems kind of strange as doing that. Um, so that's when we were able to figure out, okay, seems like it's something wrong with our uh, set point on our elevator. So when we look at our code, it's been a while since I've done this, but um, I think it's over here. The issue ended up being that in our set height inches, we would reset our current set point. So basically the, the process I did for, I looked up set point uh, on this file and then I just went through, oh, sorry, zoom is in the way again. Uh, I just went through each instance of where it's being uh, set or adjusted. And you know, this is fine you know, the inputs, that makes sense. Uh, logging it, that's normal. Um, this is just doing some math with it and figuring out how much voltage to apply the motor. That's also normal. Um, this I thought was maybe an issue for a while, but it wasn't. Um, and then eventually we narrowed it down to this. Basically what was happening was that because of the way we structure autonomous, we had an event in the middle of our path that would tell the elevator to go at a certain height. And at the end of our path, we also had that same command run at the very end of the path to say, go at a certain height. And when we called those set height functions back to back, you can see that our set point was reset to the current um, position that was recorded from the encoder. And you can see that it kind of lags behind, right? Where that point's up here, but then it drops down to what this value is over here in the next frame. So that's how we were able to solve that issue also. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. So more about how it played a crucial role in our season. Um, so yeah, it definitely made autonomous testing far more efficient and streamlined. Uh, and the simulator allowed us to create um, and test complex auto routines, which will get to what made our auto routines a bit more complex than usual in a moment. Uh, and the debug sequencing issues, um, the safe space, uh, and a rough idea of what the auto should look like before each wheel touched carpet. Uh, one thing that should be noted, though, is that although there is a bit of a vision simulation that you can do, uh, the um, simulation isn't very good for vision data because then you'd have to simulate cameras and um, really you just have to do that in the real world and uh, debug that with your cameras. So um, that's one thing to note. Uh, also, <laughs> uh, you want to avoid this uh, and how you do that is um, by using advantage scope so that you don't make logical issues like leaving your elevator up after you score. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we can use the simulated elevator. I just want to go back one side, Tim, real quick. Yeah, yeah. Just, just to like give more context. Basically, we, we were developing this auto you see on the right side. We developed that on our laptop on the left, tested it completely, and then ran it on, on the carpet. It kind of just worked, which is really nice. Uh, and kind of cool story is while Tim was working on this auto on the laptop, we were actually debugging another auto. So it was like double productivity where you can debug one auto in real life, create more autos in the computer. That was really great. Yeah, things in programming rarely work on the first try, but with advantage scope, your chances increase slightly. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can view the simulated elevator movements and stuff uh, with the 3D environment. And because there's actually like a mechanism 2D kind of variable with the WPI lib, um, you can just put that in and it will act as a simulated uh, simulated mechanism, depending on what you're using. Uh, and then we can like debug localization by seeing like estimated poses. Basically how we did that was we said, okay, uh, our left camera thinks we're here. Our right camera thinks we're here. Our back one thinks we're here. Um, and like if two are like on point and one's completely off, we can see, okay, there's a problem with that one. Uh, and we can also check like the ambiguity of each camera with advantage scope. Uh, and that can let us know like which cameras aren't doing very well. Um, and of course we can replay competition matches with, with this. Um, so yeah, <laughs> here's an example of that. Uh, I guess I'll just show you it. So this was, I believe Qual's 91 at, uh, DCMP. So 
On the right is sim, on the left is real life. And Sonic Squirrels are in the upper right and blue. Yes, that's us. So you can see that um, our simulated elevator and stinger subsystem, we call it stinger and elevator. Basically our mechanism uh, is a pretty much pretty bit uh, bare bones. It's just a couple of lines, but you could import your own CAD models and get it to look more realistic. We just didn't think it was worth the time. Uh, and then you can see all those green lines there. That's every time we get a pose estimate from the April tags. Um, and you can see that little ghost over in the top right. That's actually one of our autonomous features. It's uh, basically saying where the target for our auto line is. Um, yeah. And then you can also do this uh, thing with advantage. Well, you can do this thing with WPI Lib where you have the trajectories of your auto paths, and you can just throw them into advantage scope, and it'll just show you exactly what your auto path is, which is pretty cool. So they, on the bottom left near the human player feeder station, you can see a yellow line. That's the trajectory that we generate on the fly uh, for auto land on the human player side. Yeah. So pretty cool. I don't know if we won this match or not, but <laughs> barely. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So bringing it over okay. to Kush now. Yeah. So kind of going over our vision system and our localization. This was probably the biggest. Um, single feature of or advancement that our team made this year in programming um and just to throw it back a little bit to advantage scope also is this vision system combined with advantage scope was also really nice for presenting to judges a lot of judges really liked getting that that feedback from seeing your software in advantage scope of course it's probably going to be diminishing returns as more and more teams start using it but if you want to uh, you know elevate your pitch to judges for awards programming it's a really good way to um, anyway, yeah, moving on. So, yeah, what is what is localization? Essentially, it's basically answering the question, you know, where is my robot on the field? Um, there's two main ways that we're achieving this. First one is through odometry and using the IMU to calculate our distance travel using the, the encoders uh, and get the rotation. That's pretty simple. That's been pretty standard. Um, the second cool way is through vision April tags so or able to use photon vision to get a relative pose estimation relative to the tags. And then we're able to combine that in pose estimators um, to get one kind of definite pose. So uh, individually, they aren't that great, but when you combine them together in pose estimators, the odometry and the vision, that's when you get really good crisp results. So kind of significance in the impacts. Um, Top teams, a lot of top teams have started using localization uh, to some degree, at least. Uh, we really invested into getting fold field localization. Uh, some other teams kind of only cared about it in the community zone where they're using auto line on the grid. Some teams kind of went for the, the full field. Uh, but a lot of the more advanced teams are definitely trying to get as good localization as possible. So that's it's really good to invest into that as early as possible. Um, another thing is it's, it's really good for autonomous reliability. Um, for example, this year with the bump being in the community, it's, it's kind of hard to maybe even offset your paths manually to account for that bump and how it shakes up your robot. Using vision allows you to correct your paths midway. Uh, let's say like we had a couple times where our, our teammates have hit us slightly in our autonomous and normally that would knock us off course, but we're able to correct for it with vision. Uh, so that's been super great. Uh, it's also the foundation for creating autonomous actions during teleop. Um, without this, you're kind of stuck either using autonomous through like actively seeing a vision target, either the reflective tape or the you know, specific April tag. Um, but you know, if you have localization, you can kind of do an automation from almost anywhere on the field. Uh, also, it looks really good for judges. It's been one of the, I think this is probably the single uh, biggest achievement that kind of helped us win the most awards. So kind of the basic overview of what this looks like is we use April tags. Um, we prioritized our April tags over reflective tape this year, um, just because next year they're not gonna have reflective tape. So it's 
probably a good idea to get used to it as quick as possible, uh, using able tags as quick as possible. Um, so the way that we structured, is, structured it is that we have three cameras and two pies on our robot. So each camera is hooked into a pie and then photon vision is running on that coprocessor. Uh, and photon vision uh, basically over, over, network, uh, over network tables just sends back the data it gets from the camera. So, you know, which tags it sees, um, you, know, you know, the current uh, timestamp it saw the tag at, all that stuff, all, all the photon vision data basically. Uh, and then the robo Rio is able to compute, uh, use that to compute our, our poses. So again, um, on the odometry side of localization, uh, it's, it's really good to have odometry because it's, it's a constant thing that always updates no matter what. Um, so it, it's good between vision estimates, you get some relative uh, movement between the two poses, you're able to at least get a relative idea what that looked like. Um, not gonna be perfect, but it's still really good. Um, and then, you know, our pose estimator is updated every loop with odometry. So every every 20 milliseconds, we throw in our odometry data to the pose estimator. And you know, on any event that we get a vision estimate that's good and within our tolerances, we add that asynchronously to the pose estimator. So you know, cameras and IMU and sort of goes into the robot Rio. Um, another thing, so this is probably a little bit better side to give you an idea. So Again, we have odometry through 361 lib uh, that gets thrown straight into our Swerve pose estimator. So the Swerve pose estimator is a class that WPI lib has um, to estimate poses. And for our vision side, or we have something called photon vision estimators, photon vision pose estimators. This is something that photon vision developed uh, specifically for vision estimation. So they have a class called, if I remember correctly, it's just photon pose estimator. Um, and the reason we use that and not just directly throw it into the pose estimator is because we want to use a feature called multi-tag, which I think we're going to talk about a little bit more later. Uh, but basically, essentially the way it works is that throw it in the pose, the photon vision pose estimator, the photon vision pose estimator gives us a robot pose and we throw that robot pose into the final swerve pose estimator. And then that outputs one definitive robot position. Yeah, and you should keep in mind here that all of this needs to happen in less than a fraction of a second. Um, so we have to very well tune everything. So kind of on the topic of some of the vision advancements we made, um, 3061 lib, when it first came out, uh, kind of the start of build season last year, uh, it was a really good framework, uh, but it was kind of missing some features specifically for vision. They addressed some of those um some of those this year with the newer releases they have, they have some of these features built into the library itself. There's still some um, some algorithms and some tricks we're using with vision that uh, the one lib doesn't have yet. So kind of overview some of the tricks we use is our, our pose estimation can never leave the field. Basically, we have a bounding box between the field. Uh, and if any estimation or if the global robot pose ever says we're outside the field, Obviously, that can be. Uh, we're missing this in, in the first event, in the week one GP event. And that was uh, like, oh, yeah, it's pretty obvious. So we, we added that in. Uh, one kind of neat thing about that also is that we have a buffer to it where um, we don't just take the raw edge of the fields. Uh, for example, if we're on the blue community, we cap it in the red community, where if our post estimation says we're in the red community, we can't be in the red community because we're never going to go there. So stuff like that. Uh, it's not an insane amount of the field this year, but you can imagine next year, if you had you know, bigger no-go zones or any zones where you're not supposed to go, you can kind of completely em eliminate those from your uh, pose estimations. That's going to give you more reliable data. Another one is if our, so when vision gives you a bad reading, it's oftentimes uh, the rotation is really heavily skewed. So what we do is we trust our gyro rotation over our vision rotation because we know that the gyro, the IMU never it drifts, but it never drifts more than about two or three degrees throughout the course of the match. So if our pose estimation says that we're facing ninety degrees, but our gyro is facing zero degrees, we say throw away that pose estimation, trust our gyro. Um, another one is that we disregard poses that are far away from our current pose. So let's say that. Our current global pose estimation says that we are in the blue community. 
uh, and we get a vision estimation that says, no, you're halfway in the middle line of the field, we ignore that. Um, a caveat to that, though, is we, we scale that based on the number of tags we've seen. Um, so if we see only one tag, we can say that if the vision estimation you tell me is three meters away from my current position, and I only see one tag from that, from that vision estimation, then okay, it's within that. If it's not, then go you know, throw it away. But we increase that distance with the, the greater number of tags we see. Uh, so that if our you know, global pose estimation does shift like really, really far off where it's supposed to be, uh, when we go in the midfield and we see though, those three to four tags you saw in that, that demonstration video earlier, you see we almost see three or four tags in the middle of the field, then we know that we can kind of just reset that and, and uh, get the correct pose. Also, it's nice for when we start our auto, because when we start our auto, it's slowly, if we see the, the opposing sides April tags, we see our April tags slowly able to uh, hone in on one position. Um, another really big advance, a uh, really big feature that we have is, is multi-tag. This is probably the single best thing you can do to increase your uh, vision estimation reliability. Basically, it, it removes the, or greatly reduces the issue of high ambiguity. Because when you take each tag individually, uh, you, can, you can get ambiguity where you're not sure exactly which way it's facing because of lighting or you know, because so far away, you don't see as many pixels. But the way that multi-tag basically works is that you give it a defined layout, right? You tell, tell it, okay, tag one is here, tag two is here, tag three is here. And when you tell it that, okay, I see tag one, two, three, if tag three is really high ambiguity and it thinks that tag, the estimation it's getting is tag three is facing this way, it's able to do some math to figure out, okay, that's not possible because uh, the, the layout on the field has to be this way, this way, and this way. So then, you know, fix that. And it, it just basically reduces the issue of ambiguity uh, when you see targets. Uh, another, oh, oh sorry. sorry. One more thing. <laughs> You're good. I'll go back. And my mouse is gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there it Arrow is. Might work. Oh. oh, yeah, that's a good point. Maybe. No, they don't. No, okay. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to press escape. Oh, okay, I'm out. And professionals here. Uh, there it is. Okay. Continue. Yeah. And then the, the last thing that we did is leverage standard deviation. Standard deviation is basically just saying, how much do you trust this current estimation that your vision is telling you? Uh, so by default, uh, the default value is, you know, the standard deviation is set to 0 0.9 meters, but you can adjust that. So what we do is that if we get a vision estimation where we only see one target, we scale that by distance. So we just say, if you only see one tag and you're the further away you are, the greater your ambiguity is, but also the closer you are, the lower your ambiguity is. So what that helps us do is when we're in the community and we see one or two tags really close up, then we can really quickly trust that and really quickly zero in on one position uh, that our auto line can then use. Uh, when we see multiple tags, so this often happens in the midfield, is if we see three or four tags, we can pretty confidently be sure that it's that's kind of the position it's saying, which is how good multi-tag is usually. So we scale our standard deviation by the number of tags. So if we see one tag, it's low. If we see two tags, it's okay. Three tags, uh, sorry, other way around. <laughs> if it's one tag, then standard deviation is high. If we see three tags, sorry, if we see two tags and it's a little bit lower, if see three tags, even lower. If it's four tags, it's almost zero where you can pretty much Rely on the confidence you say that you kind of definitely know where you are. Oh, so just a quick word about like, you know, what the standard deviation is, is talking about here, right? Is that um, when you're giving your uh, pose estimator a new estimate from the camera. So the camera comes up, does a bunch of math, figures out like we think we are here based on the April tags we see. And so when you feed that information into your pose estimator, your global pose estimator, you're telling it like, you know, the camera thinks we're here, but we're kind of not sure. So we think the camera thinks we're probably within like a meter or two of this area. And so the algorithm that adds that into your pose is kind of using that ambiguity value, that, that standard deviation to sort of know how much to weight that. Like, so if you say like, we're like within 10 meters of this, it like goes, oh, okay, this is just a suggestion. But if you've got like, 
if you can see three targets with one camera and your standard deviation is low, maybe like, you know, uh, 0.1 meters, then when you feed that value in to your pose estimator, then it says, oh, okay, we really are really close to here. And it, and it can really zero in on that location. And that's where the, uh, the multi-tag PMP comes in and is super useful because by being able to see multiple tags at once, it can get that standard deviation down and have a really accurate idea of where the robot is. So, yeah. So, a couple practical applications of what we use localization for. We had two systems for um, uh, using those. So, one of them was Snap the Grid, which is our auto line for in the community for scoring on the grid and our second one was uh, our on the fly path generation for picking up cones from the double feeder station so uh for snap the grid basically the way it works is that we tell it okay here's your target pose uh, and it uses two pid controllers to control the x and y position of the robot so Pretty, pretty simple there, it's not too complicated, uh, just can tuning those PID values. Um, one thing we did uh, kind of on a hardware to software level is the, the way we optimize our cameras for these uh, automations is that our front two cameras are higher refresh rate, but lower range because they're mainly used for in the community for the auto line in the community. So we try to get as many updates as possible and we don't care too much about the range. Uh, it's still definitely good range, but not as good as our back camera. And our back camera is, is a low refresh rate camera. So that means we get updates less often, but they're much higher quality. Uh, and because they're higher quality, they're much higher range. And what this allows us to do is keep a pretty decent pose estimation in the middle of the field. And then once we get closer to the April tags, our front camera is able to rapidly converge them down to a uh, more defined position. And our other auto line feature is we have a human player pickup. So I'll just walk you through what it does here. You can see the uh, one of the robots blinking uh, bright white, by the way, that's its automation mode. It's taking over the driver and doing its own thing there. So basically what it does is it takes its current position and its target position, which is right in front of the double cone, uh, the double feeder station and draws a trajectory based off that. Um, so Path Planner actually has a library uh, that lets you generate paths on the fly. So that's what we use there. Um, the reason we use this over um, the positional system we used in the auto, in the Snapdragon auto line was that when you're coming into the human player feeder station, you off, you're often coming in with full velocity for midfield, like 100% uh, you know, max speed. So by creating a trajectory, we're able to account for that. We can basically create a curved trajectory that allows it to more smoothly drop in to in front of the, uh, the cone. And then once it lines up in front of there, it gives the control back to the driver. And then the driver able to drive you know, maybe three or four inches forward, maybe just a left or right of the vision was a little bit wrong, grab that cone. And then once our uh, we, we detect a stall on the intake motor, we know that we have the game piece in our robot. And then the robot again takes over and automatically kicks, uh, pushes the robot back a little bit and puts the elevator down. And then, you know, half a second later, the driver has full control again. So it gives us really good in and out speed for picking up cones. One thing to note is that we really uh, think that, you know, giving the driver the final say per se is really important. So when we're doing automations, we always can I give that that core final action full driver control? So in the case of the human player pickup, that's the final pickup of the cone itself. We automate everything else, but the final actual acquisition of the cone. And again, for the snap the grid, we drive all the way there. We put the elevator up, but the driver has the final say on when we actually release the cone. Um, that way, if anything does go wrong in the pose estimator, if it's slightly off, the driver can account for that in real life because you know, the code is never perfect. You never have a fully 100% accurate pose estimation. Okay, so our next segment is on autonomous. And um, autonomous kind of like feeds back into all of these different um, 
like you use advantage scope and advantage kit for this you of course you use localization and vision so um all those things kind of lead up to autonomous so um yeah all autonomouses need to start at least ours in path planner so uh basically um it's a path routing application there's also path weaver i've personally never used but um path planner has been super useful uh very intuitive and if you're using swerve just make sure to use holonomic mode if you're using uh path planner uh so basically what did we do differently about autonomous this year um so we want to run command <clears throat> run commands uh during and between path planner trajectories uh so the old way was basically uh a bunch of different commands that run sequentially or parally, parallel in command groups with a couple of delays thrown in. Um, and it was pretty unorganized. Uh, whereas now the way we do it is kind of uh, kind of like a chain, um, which we'll explain more in a second. Uh, yeah, but it uses linked lists and it can put together different paths to make it full autonomous. Uh, so yeah, here's an example of the old way. <laughs> which as you can see, uh, not very good to look at, not very good to program with. Uh, it's hard to edit, hard to read, and nothing is that precise because it's based on time rather than the actual actual position of your robot. Um, whereas the new way, uh, it's basically, um, it's a link list style class. So essentially we're just, uh, we're just adding on uh, paths and commands at one after another. Uh, that way we can say, okay, we wanna go over here and then we want our command to happen. Um, and we can uh, put these event markers into our paths, which start uh, which start basically events while you're moving. Um, and that's super useful because it's based on time or based on position rather than time. Uh, so like, if your autonomouses aren't completely reliable uh, as far as time, then it's going to start that event at different times each time you do it. Whereas if it's based off position, then it'll always happen right when your robot gets to the same place. Um, and that's helpful maybe if you want to start um, initiating your mechanism as you're getting close to the scoring. <clears throat> as you're getting close to the scoring, uh, maybe you want to start bringing, in our case, our elevator up to get the cone up where it needs to be. Um, but yeah, basically it's a trajectory with events and a sequential command group. Uh, Kayush, is there anything you want to add about yeah. this? So basically the, the idea is that it's basically chaining together two different um, ways of running commands, right? So one of them is we have obviously driving, uh, which is just a, a follow path command that path banner has. Uh, we use the follow path events uh, like Tim was talking about, to uh, have other commands run in the middle of our path. Uh, but we also want to run like maybe individual commands in the middle of paths, right? We don't only want to be able to run commands while we're in the middle of a path. Um, you know, for example, let's say you have a path that drives right up to the cube in the middle of the field. Maybe you have an event in the middle of that path that says deploy your mechanism in that position, right? But then when you get to the actual cube, when that path ends, you run a command that says spin the intake to actually acquire that cube. So having those, being able to run those commands in the middle of trajectories is kind of the key behind this new system that we developed. Yeah, and there's actually another hidden advantage to doing this more segmented style. Uh, oh yeah, and here's a quick comparison. As you can see, a lot cleaner code, uh, much easier to read, much nicer. Um, so essentially, if uh, it's a bit hard to understand uh, how we make a full autonomous out of this, but it's putting together different paths and commands. Uh, so what we can do is we can have one path that just goes over and grabs a game piece, possibly. Um, and then uh, maybe we add another path onto it that's go back over to the grid. And then we add a command that says score. Um, and then maybe after that, we have a bit of a choice. Do we want to um, engage after that or do we want to go for another game piece? And we might, might want to have two autonomouses for that. Now, in the old way, we'd have to completely make a separate autonomous to go over, grab a piece, score, and then engage, and go over, grab a piece, score, and then go over and grab another piece. 
But with this new system, we can essentially just have the same uh, first two steps and then uh, we can split off from there. And that means that debugging one of the first steps in one path fixes it for the other path because it's the same step. Um, so that's been extremely useful and has sped up our debugging quite a bit. Um, so yeah, uh, the coordinate system has been such a headache with this uh, style of game. I'm really hoping next season they might just go back to the radially symmetrical style. But uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, as you can see in the bottom right, uh, the field this year was very symmetrical. Um, and most people are probably familiar with this. Uh, if you're if you're programming autonomouses, you're definitely familiar with this. Um, but the problem with this is that uh, depending on if you're blue or red, from the robot's view, the entire field has just been flipped. Uh, and another problem that kind of came up is that the April tags are going to be in the same places no matter which way which uh, alliance you're on. So you can't really just uh, flip the field every time you switch autonomouses because then the April tags would be in the wrong place and your uh, field would be backwards. So uh, how we fixed this was basically just by saying, okay, zero, zero is here. Uh, and I believe it was in the bottom left of the field for us. Bottom uh, right of blue. Bottom, oh yeah. Um, yeah, so we just said it's here. Oh, and I guess this would be bottom left, sorry, never mind. My in bad. the picture bottom left, but yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, we said it's here and it's always gonna be here no matter what alliance we're on. Uh, and that allowed us to, it fixed a lot of the issues with switching alliances and April tags, but obviously that brought in a couple of new issues. Okay, well, if you have it all the same, then when you run a blue path on the red side, the robot's gonna whoosh over to the blue side and try to run the autonomous over there, which obviously wouldn't be the best strategy. So um, we actually found that uh, Path Planner and the whole setup had um, a solution for that, which allowed you to um, flip the path. Uh, but I believe we were having some issues with that too. Um, so we ended up doing, uh, I believe, some math that uh, it's a bit complicated, but essentially it just flips the path to the other side. Um, and it worked pretty well, although we did have some issues with commands that were uh, move in the positive direction. Well, we have to say, okay, if we're on red, move in the negative direction. If we're in blue, move in the positive direction. Um, and so each time we did a command, we had to have the uh, blue alliance case and the red alliance case, but it did end up working out in the end by having the zero, zero in the same place every time. Um, so there's also a link to overriding path planners implementation if you end up viewing the slideshow at the end. Um, so yeah. One Katie quick note wanna... about the path planner thing was path planner would basically, it would flip your, your Y axis. Cause if you rotate radially, then that's how you would flip it correctly. But if you do that, then everything is misaligned and mismatched. Your top auto goes to the bottom on red side and your April tags go to the wrong spot. Um, so instead of doing that, basically what we did is we took the path, took the X and Y coordinate, and we, we flipped the cosine value of our, our X coordinate there. And if you think of a unit circle, if you negate your cosine value, you basically flip it horizontally. So we would flip it horizontally, and then that's how we were able to shift it to the red side. So that link over there will send you to um, the, the part in our code where we actually did that manually. So now though, I think Cyborg actually talked about this on their first day is the, the new version of Pathfinder actually accounts for that. They flip it correctly. Um, but when we started using Pathfinder early in the season, uh, the first few versions at kickoff did not. Uh, so we had to override that and do it custom ourselves. Yep. Okay. So now we're going to have a bit of a demo of creating an autonomous routine. Yeah. So this kind of combining everything here, we're going to give you an example of what our process would look like for developing an auto, uh, testing it out in the simulator with advantage scope. Um, can I give you an overview of why it works so well for us this year? So I right, share my screen. And let's take a example, right? So path planner, we wanna make a new path. Um, 
and then I will just call that demo path one for now. And let's say we start here. Um, Bitcoin is somewhere here. It doesn't have to be an actual auto for competition. The reversal point, we don't want that. Let's say we end somewhere here. Um, and we want to run, so we want to run a command before this directory starts over here and then after the directory ends. So let's start off by doing the one that's going to happen during the path. So we want to create a event for that. Uh, if we want to add a marker here, uh, we have to give it a name. We'll do that in one second. But let's say I position it over here. So now we want to figure out what uh, event we actually want to use. So if we look at our event map, uh, we have a couple options here. Let's see what's the easiest one to demonstrate. Um, maybe, okay, mech high cube. Sure. But this is our command for scoring high. So if we put that into path planner, it's not going to run that event here. And let's also, let's do another path to, to chain off this. Let's make another path. We'll call that demo path two. So the way that we synced our, like if we had multiple directories in one auto, uh, the way that maybe not the best way, but the way that we found work easiest is copy the values of uh, final position here. So I copy that remember Y is 0 0.59. Then we'll go here and then we'll adjust the start point here to match those values. And then Let's say let's go across the field, make it simple. Uh, let's say we do something there, and then we'll you know drive all the way here. Why not? Um, and then again, let's let's try doing a uh, try doing two events this time. Why not? Let's do two events. Uh, let's make one here. So add a marker. Let's make it somewhere here. Maybe we throw a cube into the red community there, and then I'm gonna add a new one for now. Uh, whoa, why is this interesting? Why is this not? Hmm, do I have to change this? I haven't actually remember. Tim, do you know why it's not switching to the other event? Uh, let's see. Oh, um, you only have one event currently. So if you click off, of that oh, event, I see. Okay, okay, that's that makes sense. Okay, ah, and then you got it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Forgot, been a while. No problem. Um, no problem. <laughs> let's make one event over here. So do that. So over here, what I want to run here is I want to run the uh, or command for throwing the cube, uh, which we I think we do call mech yeet, yeet the cube. Um, so if we go back to path planner, then we'll call that here. I don't actually need an event too. And then here, actually, we need another event before this, I just realized. Because we need to put our like position there. Prep. Yeah. So because we have a a command that puts it at the correct height, and then a command that throws the cube out. So is it mech? Yeah, this one over here. So if we copy that one in here, you see now we have three events. This one is the correct one. This one is for actually throwing the cube. This one will maybe we'll put the elevator back uh, in its stow position, which I don't know if we, do we have a stow, mech stow, yep. We'll put that in there. Very legal autonomous, of course. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we, our goal is we wanna run some command before this path starts and then run this path, some command here when the path ends and then run our path two. So, what that would look like in our code after we set up path planner is let's see uh find a good spot for it uh demo auto so we want to load our trajectories load path yep path uh demo path one that and what okay interesting 
uh, that's two. And now here's where the, the real magic happens, right? Is now we want to make a our chooser element. So let's start off with the base case. Our we want to start off uh, chooser element. So this has two fields, right? This first trajectory field, it's actually optional. The reason we have it here is because we use those trajectories to chain together a big trajectory uh, that we can later view in uh, in uh, advanced scope. So that'll make more sense in a little bit. But if I'm just running some action here, uh, let's say special command group. Let's say when I begin, I want to put the elevator in slow position. Sure. And then now, after I do that, say my next action. Okay. Let's see if we can uh, format this spotless, maybe. Might not. Okay. See, so it should hopefully in a little bit. But you can see we have, oh, come on. Set next. We have two, three. Uh, Overrides here one, which is just the path to our user element, or this is the, the one we want here, which where define a path instead of a command. So our next action is first paths. So remember, we want to run some command and then run a path. So first path is named path one. It is the initial path. So we use this to reset our odometry before uh, we go. And hopefully now spotless will format this for me and make it look good. There we go. So now, again, um, after, let's say we want another, uh, another command we want to run. Let's say we want to run. Uh, so the command we're running in our path planner path is we're saying, go to the mech high cubes so that's scoring high. So let's say we want to zero, go back to, to zero uh, inches of height. We'll say, Zero the, zero the elevator. Um, zero in this case doesn't mean zero the encoder, but just means go to the zero position. Um, and then again, so we want to do another path here. This time it's path two. It is not the initial path, second path. And draft console in for me, that's nice. Get the event map again. And then let's say we want to run another command after that. Um, let's see. Um, I don't know. Let's say, let's say we change the LED color. Set color. Uh, actually, I don't know if we have the LEDs in here. I don't think we do. Never mind. Let's we'll do something else. We'll say, we'll say go to the slow position again. Why not? Slow position, right? So I think we need one more. Yep. So you can see here we developed a fairly complex auto routine, and it looks pretty nice. And uh, we can always clean this up in a little bit as well. I can show that to you later. But give you an example for what simulating this autonomous would look like is this is, again, built into the CC1 lib also is that they have a base case for simulator robot. So we change our robot type to simbot. Then we simulate our robot code. Meantime, I will open up advantage scope. Takes a little bit to build. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Uh, Zoom is in the way again. Okay, can't actually. Okay, uh, that didn't work. Did it? Did, okay. No, okay, one second. This is awkward. Sorry about that. The the zoom top bar was in the way I couldn't hit. Okay. Oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. So this is kind of the default WPI lib. This looks normal if we've done simulation WPI lib before. Um, but the, the cool thing with Vanish Scope now is that whoops, I don't want that back up here. Uh, we can connect to our simulator and you can see we can get real-time uh, data from that. 
So let's find a 3D field. Let's say we want to put our uh, robot on there. We'll put our mechanism simulation on there. Um, let's also put our auton trajectory in there, which is over here, I think. Um, and yes, yeah, so right now this, this doesn't look, there's no auton trajectory on there. And that is because I forgot to do something, which is forgot to add it to the chooser. <laughs> Um, That's a good point. <laughs> whoops. So if we go back in here. We have to actually add it to our chooser. Uh, not here, up here. So let's see, add a command, uh, demo auto. Then I can go into why it's a supplier instead of just a function call in a little bit. Uh, demo auto. So the, the reason it's this is a supplier instead of just the just, instead of just returning the auto chooser element is because we only generate the autonomous when we either select an autonomous or if we change alliances. So this allows us to uh, load these paths correctly because with our, our load path function over here, this is where we actually flip the positions uh, to match the way we want them. So that's why we have suppliers every time we switch an auto or we change alliances, we uh, call the supplier again. So, now I have to run this code again. Zoom, come on. Oh, really? Okay. So yeah, if you're having any trouble with this or any of the other things on this list, um, our code, our 2023 code is actually public. So um, we also left a link to that in the presentation. Um, so I definitely advise uh, taking a look at that and seeing if you might be able to learn anything mm -hmm. from it. We definitely had tons of issues in this process, so. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. This goes back up here. So now in our, yeah, you can see our chooser is here, right? Go down, we have demo auto. There you go. Uh, and go back to advanced scope. You can see, there we go. So this all contradictory field, uh, it was able to build and get that full autonomous down. So if you remember uh, how I was talking about, uh, how I was talking about this trajectory field here is auton chooser element has trajectory and a command. The trajectory is used for compiling a full on trajectory that we can later display in a range scope. So now um, if we, let's see, let's also throw on the vision because why not? It's kind of cool to see. Uh, sure, that is going to be vision target. Now, if I go back here, and I uh, hit autonomous there. And we go back to advantage scope. You can see it starts running. See, it runs that event there, stops, runs an event over here, keeps going, runs events. So it's kind of fast, but the nice thing is that you can also create re like log files for this too. I don't, can we play it in half speed in this? I don't know if you can. Let's try doing that. Maybe we can see it a little bit better. We do autonomous again. You can see, don't think it's playing. Is it playing off speed? No, it's not. But maybe it is. I can't really tell. But you can see it's, it's running events in the middle and uh, after paths are over. So that's kind of an overview of kind of what we do for creating autonomous, simulating it, um, viewing it. And then the next step for this would be to test it on the real field. Yeah. Don't think, did I miss anything, Tim? I think that covers. I think that, uh, I think that's good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. cool. Uh, and sometimes with that, you might have an issue where your robot starts like moving around frantically. Uh, that's usually just problems with the Sims uh, uh, drivetrain, which is what comes with the 3061 lead. Again too. <laughs> um, what Tim is talking about here is if you notice over, over here, this robot, it's kind of starts jiggling a little bit. Um, which is not normal. We thought that was an issue. There are, are like code logic. Uh, it turns out it's not. What the issue is that the, the sort of simulator, the way it works, that's actually eight flywheel simulators. So I assume there's some jankiness with that, um, with how it calculates when, it, when you stop, maybe it has some momentum left over or something like that. But on the real robot, on the real field, it did not jiggle like that. So. That's just a weird simulator issue. Yeah, yeah. 
All right. Uh, yeah, so, oh, okay, there we go. So if you take away anything this, from this presentation, it should basically be that the overpowered things that every first programmer should use are the vision system and localization, uh, advantage scope and their simulator, and also advantage kit, which kind of goes along with that, uh, and the 3061 library. Uh, so localization, it unlocks so much automation, uh, autonomous precision, and it was a huge part in how we actually managed to win four autonomous awards uh, last season. And also um, the advantage scope simulator was an, like an insane boost to our programming team, like on all fronts of our robot journey. It was just the best for debugging and it gave us the perfect way to do our autonomous routines beforehand and uh, all the replay data from our matches. Um, and then the 3061 lib is insane. Uh, it's like a nuclear launch pad for any team that wants to do vision and swerve. Uh, and it's super well optimized to work with advantage scope. So yeah, if you don't have any of those, uh, if you don't have one of those things on that list, you should definitely consider implementing it. And one more thing with the advantage scope uh, simulation and just using advantage scope, it's really nice as a training tool as well. If your team ends up developing uh, like a basic uh, mini bot, you can kind of adapt that for advantage scope uh, and advantage kit using advantage kit, you can run that advantage scope and you can use it as a training tool because uh, people, you know, if you only have one robot, you can actually have people run that code on their laptops and test out logic there. And then eventually later on, give them access to the real robot. So it's a really good training tool as well. Yep. All right. So now we're going to have a little bit of a Q&A session. Uh, we dropped a lot of information. So um, if you had any questions, this is definitely the time. Uh, there's a couple like of the subjects we talked about on screen. So yeah, if anyone has any questions. Inspiration for questions. Yes, yeah. yes. So that, that's been our presentation. If you questions, please let us know. Yeah. Uh, share the presentation. Yeah, link, Tim, can you find the the link to the presentation? Uh, yes. The public link. Can, yeah. Here, actually, I'll do that. Okay. Real quick. Share. Boom. Oh, that's yeah. not it. No. <laughs> In the meantime, I can share the presentation. Just uh have that yeah, list of not, potential topics not. still up there. But yeah, if you have questions, let us know, let us know. Yep. Yep, Let's see a hand raised. I, I don't think I can hear you. It might be yeah, muted, I don't think I can hear you. You're not muted. No. Microphone. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, this is fantastic. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So much, so much we have already learned from this. And as we explore more with these tools, I'm sure we'll learn much more. Um, I had, uh, I think, two primary questions, one having to do with vision and the other having to do with um, uh, with advantage kit mm -hmm. uh so we'll start advantage kit first um so when you uh use advantage kit do you copy uh that code into your ro robot project or are you sort of using it as a separate project that you link to um and if and regardless of which one of those it is uh when you're when you're sort of tuning it for your own robot um uh are you changing code that's sort of in the library or are you uh sort of supplying additional files that sort of link to the library it's sort of this is a a sort of java structuring question yeah i can i can share our code base and i think it'll make a little bit more sense when i show you that okay. so um yeah there we go that's so the presentation I, can I, there we go um so to answer your question, basically there's this in, in robot.java. See, and normally uh, you would extend either command, I think it's command robot or just the robot, timed robot base, I think. So mm -hmm. what advantage, uh, mechanical advantage has is that they have a, 
class called log robot. So this is kind of the framework that they have that allows advantage kit to do its thing. And one you, once you extend this and then you feed it some more values. So uh, in our robot init, for example, uh, this is just metadata stuff, but okay, this is this main thing here is you can give the, the logger, which is just a, a singleton class. So you can logger get instance. Mm -hmm. And you can, you know, give a data receiver. So that's basically like where it writes to. It can either be like live data, like a network table or, you know, file on the Rio. Um, this is kind of set up there. And then once you basically you call this function over here, uh, then it starts logging it. So you can, I have, of course, a little bit. If you explore into the log robot, you can kind of get a little bit of the specificity of how, uh, Vantage Kit works. The two videos that we linked to in one of the slides in our presentation, that's probably that's probably the first step I would recommend to learning about Advantage Scope and Advantage Kit. Right. Uh, because they the creator of Advantage Kit actually talks about how to use it and kind of theory behind it and how it works. Um, okay. the other question is yes, you basically you're you're creating more files basically. Um so you 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 know you have a bunch of the, the core structure to a subsystem is these IO classes here. You create these IO classes. Um, and then we, then this IO class lets you, um, let's see, log inputs here. And this IO class is kind of the, the core thing for logging and also for the creating those simulation and in real okay. Um, classes. Okay. Fair enough. But I think those videos go into much more depth and able to explain them much better than I can. Great. Okay. But, but yes, um, but specifically, Carl, you, you there, um, you're not changing anything about the advantage kit. That's just basically the sort of shim that goes in as a layer around your code that kind of allows you to okay. log everything that happens on the way in and way out. Okay. So, yeah. But it, but it's complete in itself. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, cool. Uh, the question about vision was, um, can you say a little bit about what cameras you used, what their resolution was, their field of vision? Um, and you said that those cameras were, were just uh, feeding their outputs to the Raspberry Pis, right, mm -hmm. that were on the robot. But, but I'd be very curious about the specific camera, about more specifics about the cameras. There is a doc. I'll try pulling out the document. Tim, if you want to talk in the meantime, yeah. I'll try pulling up the, the document that we used. Okay. I'll talk a little about um, our co-processing. So we actually, um, this last season, had two co-processors, Orange Pies, which uh, our three cameras fed into. Uh, and we basically just splashed those with the information to do the um, pose calculations from the cameras. Um, and I believe that's also where... Actually, I think we had our um, pose estimators, the um, photon vision ones, on in our actual like code for the Robo Rio, um, and then that's where that went to the main pose estimator. Uh, so that's a little bit, I guess, about how we do co-processing. Um, Katie, you could probably explain that yeah. better. Bryn, do you but... have that that one document that we followed to? Uh, I don't remember what it was called. Can't find it on Teams anymore. I, I I just dropped it into okay. chat. Um, oh, cool. So somebody yeah. else on Chief Delphi had done an in depth on like what cameras to use and what worked best, uh, and they did a sort of A B test between different coprocessors. We ended up using the Orange Pi, uh, and, that, and there's a Google Doc I just dropped into the chat. That, I see that has the yeah. details that that we used, and we basically followed their um, suggestions. Okay, great. We have, we, uh, the camera, the, the only camera we used this year was actually for um, the drivers themselves. And um, the challenge was getting uh, adequate uh, latency and bandwidth uh, mainly and, and image quality, balancing all those things. Um, and, finding finding uh, advice about that was very hard so if if we don't have to do the same thing for vision cameras that would be very very no, good no no the the vision camera feeds don't leave the robot so yeah. yeah trying to get um a good 
camera feed for the driver is is nearly impossible given the, the competition setup. Yeah. Well, we ended up with something that was adequate, but it wasn't, in, you know, but lots of trade offs there. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Was, there was also first. a tool that we used because Photon Vision has a bit of an issue where if you use multiple of the same physical camera, it has a bug where it can't, like, you just can't, it doesn't work. Um, so we went into, uh, we like renamed like the hardware ID, right? And I'm not sure um, exactly what tool we use, but I'm going to try finding that. Um, Bruno, if you have more info on that, I think we will share that. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm trying to dig that out of my history somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so uh, if you try to plug in multiple of these inexpensive uh, high resolution cameras that are listed here, um, they all have the same name on ID, USB and yeah. it can't tell them apart. Yeah. So you either do one camera per Orange Pi or you get this special firmware changing thing that lets you rename them all. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah, it's vaguely documented. <laughs> and maybe, for, um, maybe that will be fixed in Photon Vision for next year, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> um, we might be able to also share our actual pipeline that we used um, if we have that. Hmm. I'm not sure if we saved that anywhere. Um, online though. I'll I'll try looking for that. But yeah, in, in the meantime, if there's any more questions, feel free to yeah, ask. Yeah, definitely. So, you know, since you're asking questions about vision, I just kind of want to just throw out a, a big caveat here and warning that we, we started messing around with the this library and with the Photon Vision like in December of this last season, right? And I don't think it really came together where we were doing good location until like DCMP. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was like a whole season kind of uh, challenge to get to that point. So cool. Good to know. Um, so start start early. Um, I think there's a lot of things about Photon Vision that are going to be a lot better. I think there will probably be things about Limelight that are going to be a lot better this season. Um, so it should get easier and better. Um, but yeah, it it's uh, it was a challenge. Yeah, mm -hmm. which is why we had all of those different um, strategies for making the vision better. Um, which we definitely suggest that uh, teams use. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things, and, then we, and it gets touched on a little bit in this talk, and you can sort of see, like, with the lines of, like, you know, what, which April tags we can see. Um, we actually were, like, changing some of our autonomous routines so that the cameras had a better view of the tags during the autonomous, so that we'd have time you know, so like when we went over the bump in autonomous, we'd have time for the cameras to fix our positioning before we went to grab a game piece, you know, and, mm -hmm. and before that, you know, the temptation is always like, if you've ever done autonomous, it's like, like, oh, we're off by three inches to the right. Okay, well, we'll just adjust the path, you know, to be three inches to the left, and that'll fix it. And then the next time you run it, you're like, right four inches to the left, you're like, ah, you know, and yeah. so you're always chasing your tail. And so we kind of made the decision to lean into vision and try to make vision work. And um, we got there. So we're yes. <laughs> so, great job. Yeah. Great job. Yeah. And another kind of trap you can fall into is mid game uh, for mid game automation. Um, like let's say for our snap to grid, one strategy we used is instead of just having it uh, choose where to go right when you press the button and then just stay with that. Uh, we had it constantly update based on uh, like our uh, localization as the command was happening. That way, if uh, we started going in and then we got a new measurement that said, oh, we're a bit off, then we could change our um, velocity uh, midway through going into score. 
Um, so you definitely want to constantly be updating uh, to what your localization says during a command. Showing you a practical example of what that kind of looks like is, uh, Tim, can I show sure. real quick? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's basically, um, if you look at, that's a pretty good example here. See, so if we're looking at the grid over here, let's say as we're coming in, we want to auto align to this node over here. So, you know, since we're in midfield, it's not going to be perfect um, pose estimation, right? As we come in, maybe it thinks the, ro the robot's face. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Yeah, I can, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's say the robot's supposed to be here, right? But the pose estimation thinks it's over here. If you hit that uh, command and you only select the target in the initialization of that command, it's going to pick this over here, even if half a millisecond, like maybe a millisecond later, the pose estimation updates and realizes, oh, yeah, I'm here now. Uh, it's still going to try going here. So that's why we, in, the, in our execute of the command, we were constantly pull for what the closest node was and update that constantly to make sure that as soon as we got better uh, pose estimation, we would kind of get ready and pick the correct spot. Yeah. So are there any other questions about localization, advantage kit slash scope and 3061 stuff? Okay. I guess I have one more uh, 3061 question then. Yeah. Um, so I, I think you said that it was, uh, it was, uh, it is for uh, Falcon 500 motors. Mm -hmm. um, it, did you have a sense of whether it would be difficult to change that to Spark Neos? Is, I can, I, I can actually show you. Um, mm -hmm. It wouldn't be difficult, difficult, but it would be like, if, if you have the experience on dealing with it, it wouldn't be too difficult, but okay. um, it's it's possible. Uh, in fact, Tim, can I share my screen real quick? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> this whole thing. Yeah. Um, basically, the, the way it works here is that you have a uh, library. So you have this right here, this talent effects, right? So you mm -hmm. could basically create another IO class that's maybe sort of module IO Spark Max. And you could adjust these uh, these functions to work with Neos instead of Falcons. Okay, yeah, we we had uh, two two drive bases this year. One was uh, Sparks with Neos, and mm -hmm. the other was Falcon Five Hundreds, and mm -hmm. we coped. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Uh, I think there's also Sushi Squad has a one. Nope. Ace Neo Swerve 4061 40, 40, Yeah, this is yeah, there we and, go. Uh so go ahead. Yeah, and in, in 3061, I they're using the base Falcon Swerve library is what, what they're using. Um okay. in, in there. And I bet if you reach out to them, because there are a lot of people who are trying to, you know, use Neos as well for, for mm -hmm. Swerve. Um, given all the issues with Falcons, <laughs> with Falcons, um, yes. we've we've had all the issues. Um, but uh, so I I think it wouldn't be too big of a challenge to drop in a different sort of library. Yep. And I think if you start a conversation now with um, you know thirty sixty one, they would probably be willing to help out with like integrating some kind of non Falcon centric swerve. And that's a link to what Sushi Squad developed for a Neo sort of library. It doesn't have advantage kit um, integration at all, but it's similar to the like base token sort of that three three six four developed. So you can kind of get an idea for what sort of with Neos might look like. Okay. Okay. Um, unless we have any more questions. I'll just give like a couple of seconds in case anyone wants to chime in. I think we're good. Yeah, looks like it. Yeah. Okay. So uh yeah, we wanted to oh there we go. Wanted to thank everyone who came to the meeting, who wanted to learn more about this stuff, especially uh 4061 for um hosting all of this and doing all of this. It's been super fun. 
Uh, hope to see you guys at competition, possibly. Maybe be on the same alliance, you know, it'd be pretty cool. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. Thank you great. guys for presenting. This was great. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much. No problem. Awesome. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we, we will work on uh, getting the videos mm -hmm. up uh, here shortly. Yeah, Kayush, okay, I'll be in touch with you because I'm thinking maybe we'll link your slideshow in along with mm -hmm. the recordings. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. And thanks, Sounds Aiden, good. again yeah. for making detailed notes. Super. Okay. Well, uh, are we ready to end this? I think so. Sounds like. Okay. Well, <laughs> thanks, everybody, and see you at competition in 2024. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you. So long. Have a great evening. Bye. Bye bye. Good evening. <laughs>